And so with that, really, I'd like to present um, Scott Yanko, our speaker for tonight. He studies the um, flammulated owls in San Juan Mountains and how they cope with environmental changes. And he has come up with this very clever title about fire, snow, and the red queen. So how is it that one organism gets one step ahead of the other? And how are they interplaying in order to survive and get one foot ahead of the other? I know we've taken more time already than we wanted, so I will keep it short and sweet. He comes to us from UC Denver. He's a PhD candidate and he is um, doing some really fabulous work supporting young researchers and he, um, I will tell, let him take it away. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, let me get a uh, screen sharing up here. Okay, you sh all should be seeing my screen now? Yes, I sure do. Awesome, great. Cool, well, thank you very much um, for joining tonight, um, giving up your Saturday night to listen to me drone on about owls. I'm really excited to be here and super honored to have been invited and um, really grateful to the support from CFO over the years, um, both for some of the research I'm gonna show you here, but um, I've also known several, several of my collaborators, lab mates and friends that have been supported by CFO. And um, yeah, just really excited to, uh, to be able to share, share some of this with you all. So yeah, so I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado Denver, and fundamentally what I study is animal movement. And um, in particular, I'm fascinated by this idea that we see this incredible diversity of movements um, across organisms. And so I just want to give you sort of a really brief taste of some of that diversity. So <clears throat> a lot of bird watchers might be familiar with this. This is the just sort of a heuristic map of the migration of the Arctic Tern. Um, which migrates pole to pole um, every year. So these birds are breeding up in the Arctic and wintering down in the Antarctic, um, traveling uh, across the entire planet um, twice annually, right? So these massive movements by a, a relatively small species. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have animals that might only make a single move in their entire life. So I'm showing you here a coral. There's lots of other examples of this. Um, you know, a coral will make a single dispersal movement as a polyp and then settle in a location and never move for the rest of its life. It's a pretty similar strategy with sea sponges and they may actually live in the exact same place for tens of thousands of years. These um, migrations can be really complex as well as um, large or small. And so one great example of a complex migration is the monarch butterfly, with which I think a lot of people are probably familiar. I chose this example for a few reasons. One, the monarch butterfly winters in the exact same mountains where I'm gonna show you later tonight, the flammulated owls are wintering. So down in an area of South Central Mexico called the Central Transvolcanic Belt. And they congregate in these beautiful high elevation uh, fir forests called Oyamel um, in just massive numbers. And they'll overwinter uh, at 10,000 feet down in these mountains. And come spring, those butterflies will take off and head to the north and they'll make it, you know, near the US-Mexico border, settle down and reproduce and, and, and create another generation that'll continue that trip to the north. That'll go on through the spring and the summer and they'll reach sort of the northern border area, the northern tier states of the United States by the time fall comes around, taking probably five generations and once the weather gets cold enough, that last generation at the north will turn around and make the entire journey back south and will be that generation that overwinters um, and then restarting that migration again in the spring. So it's a round trip migration that feels really familiar to us that, that, that uh, study or enjoy birds, but it's a, it's a round trip migration that requires multiple generations to complete. So um, sort of staggering that that could even emerge. These movements can also be massive sort of in their scale, in their biomass scale. So this image that you're seeing here is, is from Nexrad weather radar, but you're not actually looking at precipitation. That thin line that's sort of stretching diagonally across that radar image is actually mostly dragonflies and probably some moths traveling south outside of Oklahoma City along a cold front. If you pay attention to the news, you see this every once in a while. I think probably it was two or three years ago, we were able to 
um, see uh, a radar image like that in, in Denver in the fall with the painted lady butterfly migration. We were talking about massive um, biomasses of, of animals, just huge amounts of animals. And there's a whole sort of uh, subfield of ecology that uses radar to try to estimate how and when and where these things are moving around on the planet. Part of the reason that these movements are so fascinating is in some ways sort of the, the flight strategies or the movement strategies themselves. You can, you can hear my bird bias coming out, right? Um, and there's lots of cool examples of, um, of these sort of flight mechanics and these movement mechanics that I could point to. And this is just one of my favorite. This is from a paper that came out a few years ago about magnificent frigate birds. They put these really cool loggers on these birds that could do not only GPS locations, but had barometric pressure so they could tell the animal's altitude um, and accelerometers so they could tell what the, what the bird was doing. And what they saw were these incredible feats of flight. They had birds staying aloft for multiple weeks at a time, never setting down on land or sea. Part of the way they did it is this technique called dynamic soaring. It's really similar to what we see with raptors migrating. Um, they find rising currents of air. In this case, it's typically winds that are deflecting off of waves on the ocean surface. And they use those rising currents of air as a lift, sort of an elevator to get up high. And in this case, they saw these birds going to altitudes up to 20,000 feet in the air, which is absolutely incredible. And then drifting off in the direction they prefer to travel. The flight is so efficient that also in the study, they had a bird that didn't flap for multiple days at a time. I mean, just incredibly efficient flight. So staying aloft long enough that they're having to go through sleep cycles um, while in the air and, and, and staying aloft without flapping for multiple days is sort of staggering. Uh, lest my bird bias show too much. Um, uh oh, my slide's not advancing. There we go. Um, Lest my bird bias show too much, it's worth noting that there's more than just these big lateral movements on, on the surface of the planet. So this figure here is a little complicated at first, but it's, it's actually this really cool migration. So in the, um, in the oceans, zooplankton will go undergo what they call a, a dial vertical migration. And essentially the idea is this, that the zooplankton want to be up on the surface where all the phytoplankton are, are, are at the base of the food chain. But in clear waters, that exposes them to predation. And so in clear waters, what the zooplankton will do is sort of migrate down the water column to areas where light can't reach to avoid predation, and then come back up that water column at night to feed when they're less at risk of, of being preyed upon. And what these researchers did is measure the strength of that um, daily change, the strength of that migration across the entire planet's oceans, and linked it with water clarity. So in areas, you can see that big red blob in the middle of the screen, that's sort of the central Pacific. Those are sort of notoriously clear waters. And so that's a place where this sort of migration is really strongly favored because being up near the surface in really clear waters is a strong predation risk. Whereas as you get closer to the poles, the waters tend to be murkier anyways. And so they saw a less strong migration. So I look at diversity like this and in all kinds of other examples and, and I'm, I'm struck and curious by what drives this diversity. So in other words, what problems are these organisms solving by moving or not moving or moving in the ways that they do and at the scales that they do? And at a really high level, the answer is sort of simple, right? It's just that resources aren't evenly distributed across the environment. So this picture here is just from the Paradise Divide area outside of Crested Butte, and you can look at it and see pretty clearly, right, there's all kinds of different habitats and resources and conditions in this picture. There's snow fields, there's cliffs, there's talus, there's alpine tundra, there's subalpine forest, um, you can see some aspen groves in the distance, you can see some riparian corridors, you can see some montane forest at lower elevations, right, not all the things that an organism might need are everywhere. So you might need to move around to acquire those resources. Environments also change across time. So this picture is at, it's actually one drainage over. So in the Gothic area near the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, but obviously it's a different time of year, right? This, this photo was taken, I think, in early March. And even though it's the same rough location on the planet, um, it would require a totally different set of adaptations to thrive in that environment. And so things like seasons can change where and when resources are available and force movements. These changes over time are also not necessarily super predictable like the seasons. And so one of the other uh, sources of environmental change that I'm going to talk to you about today is, is wildfire. 
Um, there's some predictability to it, but certainly nothing like the seasons. But obviously looking at this picture here, um, we can see that um, we can see that these environments, uh, these forests can change pretty rapidly and pretty drastically um, following a fire. So the underlying uh, question to all of this is just sort of how does animal movement solve these problems? How are animals using movement to solve the fact that resources aren't everywhere all the time? And I'm going to get to that red queen part of my talk uh, or of my title here and, and, and sort of describe to you what I mean by that um, so that it'll be in the back of your mind while I tell you two stories about flammulated owls. So and initially, this, this idea of the Red Queen um, was co-opted from Through the Looking Glass, the book by Lewis Carroll, by evolutionary biologists. Um, in the book, Alice and the Red Queen uh, start a race, and they run, and they run, and they run, and Alice looks up, and they haven't gone anywhere, right? And she asks the queen about this, and the queen says, well, now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And evolutionary biologists use this to describe these evolutionary arms races, right? And the idea here is, so if you imagine a predator and a prey species, that predator would be under evolutionary pressure to become a better predator, to evolve adaptations that make it more efficient at acquiring prey. As it does that, it increases the strength of the evolutionary predator on the prey to become better at avoiding predation. And this will go back and forth, both species changing all the time, constantly under natural selection, constantly evolving to be a better prey species. And in other words, being better able to avoid predation and the predator always evolving to be better at preying. But that balance between the two would remain constant because they're both undergoing it. And so this is called the Red Queen hypothesis in biology. More recently, uh, a researcher by the name of Ben Winger has sort of co-opted this for movement ecology to say that, well, maybe this is, we can think about a red queen hypothesis for moving and taking moving in this case quite literally. Maybe what these species are doing by moving is trying to maintain a constant experience of their own environment. Um, and so that's gonna underlie the two stories that I'm gonna tell you today. So these two stories are, are about the, the flammulated owl. Um, and the flammulated owl, so um, hopefully some of you have had a chance to see one of them there. Um, the only dark-eyed species of owl we have here in North America, they, they have those alien eyes, the second smallest species, they're a quarter inch um, longer than the elf owl. They weigh about 60 grams, which is about a C battery, which I, I recognize is um, rapidly becoming an outdated reference. I used to use um, a, the jewel case from a CD, but that's, that's even worse, um, that's even more outdated. Um, they're an insectivore. So these guys are primarily foraging on um, moths that are out at night um, and they're a cavity nester. So they're nesting in abandoned woodpecker cavities and snag trees and in aspens. That hand holding that owl is Dr. Brian Linkhart down at Colorado College, who I've been lucky enough to work for and with and, and be a student of um, for quite some time now. Brian has studied this species um, continuously in Colorado. This is his 40th field season. Um, so he has one study area in Teller County that, that started in 1981 and has continuous demographic data there. And he's done a lot of work on the basic biology of the species. And from that work, there's a few things that are really key that we've learned, and specifically the importance of habitat to these guys. So what you're looking at here is some ponderosa pine dug fir forest at mid elevations in Colorado, sort of a sweet spot for flammulated owl habitat. That tree on the left is a great example of an old ponderosa pine tree. Uh, ponderosas, when they get old, get that bonsai look at the top. It means they're at least 200 years old. And, and given where I know that picture was taken, I would be um, not surprised at all if that tree was closer to four or 500 years old. And these big old trees on the landscape are really important for flammulated owls. We know that they prefer to forage in them. They prefer to sing from them. They prefer to roost in them. Territories that have greater proportion of those old habitat types are occupied more frequently, they breed more frequently, and they produce more owlets over time. So we know that these preferences are actually important for driving reproductive trends in the species. The other really cool thing about these habitats is that it's an extremely fire prone ecosystem, and therefore it's a very fire adapted ecosystem. And so um, fires in the American West have this broad latitudinal trend. Um, and I promise this is one of just a few graphs I'm going to show you. I recognize it's Saturday night, but um, there's, there's a few that are too important to, to leave out. Um, on the southern, in the southern parts of North America or lower elevation parts of North America, 
the trend is for relatively frequent fires, maybe on the order of every five to 30 years. But when those fires burn, they're mostly consuming fine fuels, shrubs, young trees on the ground, and they're leaving the mature canopy intact. So you have this frequent low severity fire regime. At the opposite end of that spectrum, the fires would be much more infrequent, um, maybe even as long as every one to 400 years. But when they do burn, they're nearly stand replacing. And the forests across this gradient have strong adaptations to their respective fire regimes. So when you have forests that have these stand replacing events, they have sort of backup plans of serotonous cones that will release and reproduce that forest sort of catastrophically. And ponderosa pine, on the other hand, is great at dealing with low severity fire. They have thick, flaky, fireproof bark. They self prune their lower limbs so that the fire can't get up into their crown. And we see these strong adaptations. In Colorado, we're sort of a, in that low to mixed severity. So our fires definitely historically would have had a high severity component, but small, you know, a quarter of a fire or the third of the fire area. More recently, two things have been driving fires to become far more severe. First is um, over a century of fire suppression in these um, high frequency adapted ecosystems has left, uh, led to a huge buildup of fuels in our forest. Um, there's more fuel to burn, there's more fuel to get the fire up into the canopy of the trees where it can burn at a higher severity. And we also know just generally at a continental scale, burning is so strongly um, reflective of climate. And as the climate gets hotter and warmer and, um, and these storms get more severe that can push really strong winds into these fires, our fires are getting more and more severe. Which brings us to the Hayman fire in Colorado. It burned in 2002. It's still the, the largest fire in state history. It burned uh, something like 212,000 acres of forest. Again, these are areas that would have had maybe 25 or 30% high severity burn in the Hayman. Well over 50% of that burn area was at high severity. And when I say high severity, I mean this, right? Nearly 100% mature crown mortality. Um, just complete conversion of the habitat. This fire burned really close to several of Dr. Linkhart's study sites. And so um, given the opportunity, once the flames were out, um, we started a study uh, in the Hayman fire to try to understand how the owls might respond to that environment. And we did this with a technique called radio telemetry. Um, I'll apologize for this picture. It's literally the only one I could find of our, us with our radio telemetry gear. You'll have to uh, apologize or uh, excuse my sort of demonic look here. Um, but what we do with radio telemetry is, is take a, a small little backpack, essentially, attach it to the owl, and it releases a radio pulse on a regular interval that I can pick up with that antenna that will lead down to um, that uh, receiver. And then I'll be wearing headphones. You can't see it through my mop of hair, but I would have had headphones on. And when I'm pointing that antenna in the correct direction, so in the direction of the owl, that pulse will, will sound louder to me. And so using this technique, we can sort of run around these mountains at night and try to get to the tree the owl is located in before the owl splits, um, which is um, a lot harder than that even sounds. But we did this for several years um, for five males, um, and we were able to get to some of these trees and actually put a, we call it a fix, right? Put a location on a map of where that owl did a thing. Um, typically, we're able to even observe their behaviors. We know if they're foraging, if they're resting, um, engaging in some sort of social behavior, and we can map this. And so the first thing we did, so these are all the maps of all the locations. Each of those black dots is somewhere that I found an owl on the ground doing something. Um, the orange dots would have been the nest sites in those, in those years. And the underlying background is the fire severity map. So we're able to derive that with some satellite tools. So the green here is low severity or unburned forest. You know, most of the mature trees are completely untouched. And the red would be that high severity, just like that picture that I showed you. And then yellow is everything in between. The first thing we did is we can compare those specific trees that they used to other trees on the landscape um, that they could have used but didn't. So say, okay, what do the foraging trees look like compared to what was available to them? What do the roosting trees look like compared to what was available to them? And the answer was really uninteresting. It was exactly what we already knew they did in unburned forest. They like big old trees. Burn severity didn't seem to play a role in that. And that was really surprising to us. 
But the reason we think why became a little bit clear when we looked at this at the scale of the home range. So the next thing we did is sort of added up all those little pixels inside the boundaries of what we would call their home range. And that's what you're seeing that that solid blue line is sort of what the owl's territory is. And we asked what's the proportion of low severity burn inside the owl's home ranges. And we can compare that to the amount of low severity burn available to them in the Hayman fire in total. And what we saw was really striking, which is that the owl home ranges, which is the dot on the right, and that line is just showing you sort of the range of values that we observed, but the owl home ranges had substantially more low severity burn than the Hayman fire at large. And what we think this means, taking it back to our red queen hypothesis, is that at the scale of settling, when these animals are making a decision how to, how to choose a location to breed on the landscape, they're doing it in a way that allows them to continue making the same decisions they would as though a fire had never happened. So in other words, they have to avoid at their home range scale these big chunks of high severity burn, but by selecting the right habitat, by choosing the right place to be, they're able to just carry on with their regular biology. So we're um, continuing this work, looking at owls and fire um, now uh, with the direct support from CFO. So this is um, um, my next study area is the Hot Creek Research Natural Area down in the San Juan Mountains, of Southern Colorado. Um, it's on the Rio Grande National Forest. It's an area set aside specifically for research. It's some really beautiful old ponderosa pine and these big deep canyons um, and some really beautiful meadow habitats up high. This is an area where Forest Service wants to return fire to the landscape as part of the natural processes. And we're having the opportunity here now to think about um, uh, fire before and after, and to try to tease out some of the finer scale drivers of, of what might be moving these owls around. I, I don't have results from this yet. The Forest Service was supposed to burn it, um, well, they were supposed to burn it last year um, and some other fires got in the way. And then um, they were supposed to burn it this year. And I think we all know what got in the way this year. But what we're specifically gonna be looking at is this. You know, we know that they like these big old trees. We don't actually know why. <laughs> Um, and it might be that there's just more prey in them. And that's the first thing we're gonna do is try to see if that can be ruled in or out. And so we're gonna do that by following these owls around again, um, figuring out where they're moving um, and compare those movements to both the habitat and the moths. So we trap the moths, we're able to identify them. We have a collaboration with USGS so we can actually use bomb calorimetry and we can turn this into this like caloric landscape. So where are the calories for owls um, on, on the, um, on the landscape, sort of a, a map of nutritional guidelines for owls and compete these two hypotheses to see if one does a better job of explaining how they're moving around. And then seeing when fire comes through and, um, and modifies both of those landscapes, what changes. Um, so that's something that CFO has been supporting our pre-fire work for and, um, and hopefully uh, we'll get a fire in there soon and be able to sort of see the post-fire section of this um, and, and you'll have to stay tuned on it. So I wanna switch gears now in terms of the type of movement that we're talking about. And I wanna talk about migration now. And this is another component of the research that CFO has been very supportive of. Um, it's stuff that we do concurrently with several of our other study areas, but it's, a, I think, a really cool story and a, and a really large scale question of movement. Obviously, instead of now talking about tree to tree movements that an individual owl is making over the course of a few weeks, we're talking about continental scale movements over the course of the entire annual cycle. So here's the, the range map of flammulated owls. You can see the orange reddish color there is their breeding habitat, the mountainous, dry mountainous areas of Western North America. And they're um, wintering down in South Central Mexico and the Northern portions of Central America. And, and you can note that there's a year round population. So some of these birds um, don't migrate. They stay in Southern Mexico uh, for the entire year. Until very, very recently, this is all we knew. We suspected they were migrating. But all we really knew is that they went away in the winter and we did not know exactly where they went or how they got there, how fast they traveled, um, do they all stay together or not. Dr. Linkhart and I started putting out this device, which is called the Light Level Geolocator. Um, we're really hampered with flammulated owls because they're so little. Um, there's lots of really cool technology that we just can't put on our birds because it would be too heavy for them. So at the time that we were doing this study, the Light Level Geolocators were kind of the best that we could do. And they're actually a really clever tool that light stock that you see coming off the bird's backpack there is just measuring light levels. It's totally archival, so we gotta catch the bird again next year to download the data, and all it's gonna tell us is how bright it was over time. 
But what we can do is use the same method that sailors using a sextant would have used hundreds of years ago to navigate on the ocean to locate where that bird was based on the length of the day and the relative time of solar noon. If you know those two things, you know roughly where on earth you are. And with that, we were able to confirm where these birds were migrating with the first four owls who's, who returned carrying tags that also worked properly. It was really cool. But that was about all we could say. You can imagine that a technique like that doesn't really have high spatial resolution. And in fact, those blobs that you see on those map is sort of our uncertainty about where their true wintering location was. We can locate an owl using this technology plus or minus like 50 or 100 kilometers. So not super precise, but we can get these large scale movements. So this is really, really exciting. We fast forward a few years and the miniaturization of technology has really improved. Um, and so now we're able to use GPS units that instead of dozens of kilometers of, of, of error have a few meters of error. Um, so we're talking about really, really precise uh, time and location information um, for the owls that we're tracking. The downside is there are tags that will upload the data using satellites for you and you just get an email of where your bird is. Um, and our birds are too small for that. So we still have to release them in one summer, come back, hope that they returned, hope that we can catch them again and that the tag worked um, and download those data again, which is, which is quite a lot of work. I wanna pause here because I know that I, I sort of just bellyate about what's actually a lot of really cool technology. And to be sure, um, we, are, uh, we are totally in the golden age of animal tracking. I mean, the technology that we have to work with right now is really unparalleled and it's, it's increasingly miniature every single year. And so what I wanna show you is actually the first um, migratory tracking device ever. And that's this. This is called a file stork. Um, there, there were enough of these that they got a name. Um, this is the white stork. It commonly breeds in Central Europe, um, so like in Germany. Um, and in the 1820s, it was still sort of an open question where birds went for the winter. Like they knew that some birds disappeared, but nobody was clear on where they went. And, and certainly some people hypothesized something like migration, um, but there's also some really wild theories out there. So some people were convinced that birds turned into fish um, or that they hibernated or did all these other crazy things. Maybe they turned into other birds. Um, and so that was still sort of an open question. And something like 25 in separate events of these white storks showed up in the spring um, in, in Germany in the 1820s um, with a spear through them somewhere that was um, a failed hunting attempt, but that the spear stuck and was not fatal and they were able to complete their migration. Um, and somehow these birds wound up in the hands of biologists who took the spears um, to their friends in the anthropology department who were able to positively identify the group of humans that put the spear in the stork. And once you know that group of humans and where they live, you now have a location uh, for that bird. You know where that bird spent at least part of its winter because it must have acquired the spear there, right? And so that's sort of the original animal tag that confirmed migration. And so when I'm talking about uh, how hard it is to go back and recapture um, our owls, I should really be emphasizing how thankful I am that I'm not reliant on um, accidental and failed hunting attempts to, to track our birds. So I'm going to show you um, data from the first couple years of doing this. There's more data in from this summer. We have not analyzed it yet. We've recovered an additional 11 tags this summer. Um, I'm going to show you eight birds from two of our sites in Colorado. So from the Teller County sites um, and from the, the Hot Creek sites. And then um, this summer we've added some birds from the Manzano Mountains in Me uh, New Mexico, um, from the Wasatch Mountains in Utah, and a couple mountain ranges in South Central Idaho. So here are the uh, eight birds from Colorado. On the right, you're just seeing a static version of their tracks. And on the left, you are seeing, um, you're seeing an animated version here. Um, so um, I'm seeing there's a couple questions in from chat. So maybe we'll just, um, maybe we'll hit those first when we get to questions if that works for everyone. Um, these maps on the left, I, I think are just totally mesmerizing. I could and sometimes do just stare at these for a while. So great, okay, so we have this much higher resolution data. We're able to sort of tell where they went at a much finer spatial scale and a much finer temporal resolution. And we know to the minute where they were on, on the earth and that's great. Um, but getting back to this question about why move, we wanted to try to understand something about the environment that these birds were experiencing to see if we can understand a little bit better why they migrate and why they undergo this particular migration. 
So we can take these tracks um, and using satellite data that tells us something about the conditions on Earth at that place in time for each of our um, owl fixes, um, we can annotate our entire fix set and ask some questions um, about exactly those conditions that are relevant uh, that are relevant to owls. So um, the first thing we did is this. So this looks like a big mess, but I, I promise it'll make sense. On the y-axis, on the vertical axis there, you're seeing a thing called NDVI. NDVI is a satellite measure essentially of just how green a spot on the planet is. And we know that this greenness tells us something about primary productivity and biomass, right? So the greener something is, the closer that value is to one, um, the more productive that ecosystem is, the more food is there for everybody. And then on the x-axis, you're just seeing the days of the year. So zero is starting, you know, day one of the year um, all the way to December 31st. And they're color coded by um, whether the bird was wintering, spring migrating, summering, fall migrating, and then wintering again. And the thing that was striking to us about this is, well, there's a couple things. One, um, wintering and summering, the NDVIs experienced are relatively consistent with one another, right? They're, they're basically experiencing the same NDVI on the breeding grounds as the wintering grounds, if anything, a little bit lower, so a little bit less productive ecosystems. And then the second thing is just how variable the conditions are en route. So you can see that the highest variance that they're gonna experience in ecosystem productivity is when they're moving, right? When they're experiencing these highest energetic demands. We also can do this with nighttime temperatures. So the same satellite um, data, so these, these come from the NASA MODIS system, can measure um, temperature at night on the surface of the Earth. And again, we see basically the same pattern. That between winter and summer, they're experiencing a pretty narrow band of temperatures, with the exceptions of, of course, migration, when they will experience the hottest and coldest temperatures um, of their entire year. Um, and those periods right on the shoulder of the breeding season, right when they arrive and right before they depart, um, there's a, a real dip in temperatures there, down to and below freezing, which for an insectivore um, might be a pretty critical time. But broadly, the story was, right, they're tracking a niche around the planet. They're making these moves of thousands of kilometers, exceeding 20 degrees of latitude, and they're really experiencing the same temperature conditions, roughly the same productivity conditions. We know that they're going from pine forest to pine forest. So they're making all these moves to experience the same environment. So that was really cool. Maybe not super surprising. I mean, we, we sort of suspect that that's what migration does for animals is give them a more consistent environment. Um, but it's nice to see it here um, with such high spatial temporal resolution. That, that's somewhat new here. But we wanted to take another step and sort of, we know, I told you before that they, um, that there's a year round population down in Mexico that doesn't migrate at all. And so it's possible to be a flammulated owl and not fly 20 degrees of latitude to experience the same conditions. In fact, it's possible to just stay in the same place, we think, all year round and, and presumably do just fine. So we were sort of curious about, well, why do that? Um, uh, why migrate in the first place if you might not be able to? So the first thing we did was some simulations. Um, and the first simulations we did were for Colorado. So essentially what we did here is say, okay, let's imagine a bird that stays in Colorado year round, um, doesn't migrate at all. So we simulate some positions based on the known breeding locations of the birds that we were tracking and just said, what would it look like if those birds stayed on their breeding territories the whole year? And I'm gonna show you a graph that may be the most obvious scientific finding uh, ever. So these are these same two graphs of NDVI and nighttime temperature. Now what you're looking at, the grayed out points are what the birds, the migrant birds actually experienced. And the colored points are what they would have experienced had they just spent the whole year in Colorado. And what you can see, and I hope everyone is sitting down, is it gets a lot colder and a lot less green in Colorado in the winter. Um, so, right, great, Scott, you have recovered the idea that winter in Colorado is cold and there's not a lot of bugs or plants out. Um, it's very obvious why an owl would want to not leave uh, or why an owl would want to leave Colorado for the winter. The story gets quite a bit more interesting when we do the reverse. So when we say, well, what if they just stayed on their wintering territories in Mexico? What would that have looked like? And the answer is this. So same setup, again, the grayed out points are what the migrants actually experienced and the colored in points are what the simulated non-migratory strategies would have experienced. And we can see that 
Um, NDVI was slightly higher on average for uh, the non-migrants. So had they stayed in Mexico, they would have been in slightly more productive habitats. Temperature again, average temperature is slightly higher um, during, the, during the winter in Mexico. So they would have experienced maybe greater insect activity. So all in all, it's looking like migration is this huge effort to just get you somewhere um, for the summer that's a little worse than where you could have just stayed. Right? And this feels really counterintuitive now. So now we're starting to try to ask, like, why even migrate in the first place? And I think the answer to that has to do with how we think seasonal migrations actually involve, evolve. So it used to be this thought that all birds sort of originated um, from the south and that all migrations were this technique to go take advantage of this huge abundance of resources in the Northern Hemisphere. So we can see like this is alpine tundra, right? And come spring, this thing greens up and it's full of grasses and flowers and bugs and the trout are swimming in the, in the uh, streams and the lakes. There's insects everywhere. And there's this boon of resources that birds evolved to take advantage of. They're just flying to this massive pulse of resources. There's some phylogenetic research that I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about here, but also um, hopefully from the ecological research that I've shown, there's good reason to suspect that this isn't true, right? Um, at least for the flams, we can say that the resources they're acquiring in Colorado are actually slightly worse than what they would have had access to had they just stayed in Mexico. So we're back to Ben Winger here, who, who codified this idea of the Red Queen hypothesis as applied to migration. And this is a figure from his paper, it's actually called The Long Winter for the Red Queen, where he proposed a slightly different model for how birds might have evolved the seasonal migration. And it goes like this. So we look at this first panel, the, the colors here on the background are supposed to represent seasonality. So the more yellow, the more aseasonal, the more stable the environment. And so you start with this really stable environment across which individuals disperse. They just fill space. Over time, as we move into panel two, the northern parts of that range become more seasonal. So now there becomes something like a winter to deal with. And there's a bunch of things that can happen. So the red circles with the X's through them show you that, well, maybe some individuals just can't hack it and they die seasonality kills off some of these individuals. Purple might represent some sort of adaptation in place to winter. You think about um, both within birds and outside of birds, there's lots of ways that things deal with winter in, in high latitudes. Um, lots of mammals hibernate, for example. That's an adaptation to winter. Um, a lot of birds switch their prey. So you'll see a lot of birds go from insects and start consuming berries or nuts or seeds, grasses, things like that. The other thing you could do is flee, right? You can fly south, fly to where it's less seasonal. So then the question is, as we move to panel three, why would those birds ever come back? And we think the answer, and this is really just a hypothesis, although I think it's pretty well founded, we think the answer just comes down to the benefits of breeding in the same place year after year after year, which we know the flammulated owls do. The males basically never disperse. Once they acquire a breeding territory, they will basically never leave it. Females will only leave a breeding territory if a nest fails in a previous year. We know that breeding in the same places year after year after year confers these benefits to birds primarily through knowledge. They know where the prey resources are. They know where the safe places are and where the predators like to hang out. They know who the neighbors are. They know who might try to encroach on their territory. Um, they know that if their uh, mate disperses, what the other potential mates look like on that landscape. Um, so there's all these advantages to being in the same place year after year after year. And it's possible that those advantages outweigh not only the costs of migration, but, but allow you to accept resources that might be slightly subpar compared to a non-migratory strategy. And in light of this model of evolution, I would suggest that what we have seen is sort of um, the data that I presented to you today is sort of this ecological echo of this model of seasonal migration, where we wouldn't necessarily expect the resources in Colorado to exceed those um, in Mexico. And in fact, we can look at the evolutionary history of owls, and this is certainly um, a little bit of a guess, right? But it's kind of a fun coincidence, so we'll go there. You're looking at the global average temperature over the last 65 million years. Um, and what we know is that the common ancestor of flammulated owl and their nearest relative, the Puerto Rican screech owl, appears on the scene about 20 million years ago. This is a pretty warm 
time on, in Earth's history and a pretty stable time in Earth's history. We know that there's very low seasonality. We're talking about a nearly aseasonal North America at this time. And we know from some phylogenetic reconstructions that we think the flanellated owl is pretty broadly distributed across North America, Central America, and the uh, Caribbean. Sorry, not the flanellated owl, the common ancestor of the flanellated owl, broadly distributed. We know that flams and the Puerto Rican screech owl diverge about 12 and a half million years ago. This also coincides with a lot of divergences that also coincides with a rapid period of cooling in Earth's history that has been continuing until very, very recently. This cooling we know is what causes trees to retreat from the Arctic Circle. We start seeing um, strong seasonality um, in the paleo record at this point. So we know that this is when you start getting something that looks much more like our winter um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And so there's lots of reasons those species could have diverged at 12 and a half million years ago, but one of them has to include the idea that maybe um, the need to evolve a migration or the, the need to adapt a migration in flammulated owls could have driven a species divergence event. It's certainly um, plausible and consistent with, with everything we've seen, which is amazing, right? Because now we're not just talking about movement as this behavior that species undertake um, that might help them deal with an environment, but that it's actually a really substantial thing. And that not only are you solving environmental problems that you face, but that might actually change something about who you are as a species. And so that's just, I just want to show you one quick next step following on from that thought. And this is something that we're, we're working on quite literally currently. Um, it's a theoretical problem and we, we have some models that I believe actually running like as I speak. So there's this pace of life theory. Um, if, if any of you are biologists, you, um, you'll have heard of this as the R and K selected thing. We don't call it that anymore for some sort of subtle reasons. But the, the basic premise here is that organisms are always trading off time and energy that are limited. And so um, in the face of that limitation, you sort of emphasize one over the other, or you make this trade off between the two. And so in certain environments, it might behoove you to have what we call a fast pace of life, where you're basically um, unwilling to bet on your own future. You're not willing to invest a lot of effort in trying to survive a long time. Instead, you want to put um, literally all your eggs in one basket, right? You want, to, you want to produce as much young as quickly as you can. Whereas there's opposite end of the spectrum, um, you might instead emphasize your survival and try to live a long time, never putting much effort into any given reproductive effort, but instead sort of trusting that having multiple chances at it will eventually lead to your replacement of yourself. And this is, this is pretty well supported. A lot of this work, um, the pioneering work in this was done in birds. And, and now we're starting to see that there's actually behavioral correlates of this that are really cool. So if you imagine you have a fast pace of life, right? You're not, you're, you're not betting on your own future. You're, you're living for now. Um, we see that animals that have that strategy are actually um, bigger risk takers. They explore more, they're more aggressive, they get into more fights, um, they're willing to tolerate higher predation risks, they typically give their young less parental care. Um, so there's all these really cool behavioral correlates that go along with this, this whatever your evolutionary strategy is. We would call it a life history strategy. There's also a broad biogeographic trend in this, at least in birds, where birds that live at the northern climate, in northern climates, tend to have a faster pace of life than their tropical counterparts. Um, and this even goes so far as to affect their base metabolism. If you take a tissue sample from a bird at 70 degrees of latitude compared to zero, that bird at 70 degrees of latitude will be respiring at a higher rate. Um, and those birds tend to be trading off um, the future for now, emphasizing breeding now. And the reason we think this is, is because they have this crux of winter to deal with, right? If you have to try to get through yet another winter, it may not be a safe bet for you to bet on next year. You might as well bet on now because you don't know if you'll make it to next breeding season. So this gets to the, the, the heart of the question, which is what does migration do for you? Because on one hand, migration could be seen as this really, really risky behavior, right? We know migrant birds that most migrant birds that die, die during migration. So, so on, on one hand, we might expect migration to be associated with a fast pace of life because it's so dangerous. On the other hand, we, I just showed you that migration is primarily a tool to experience a constant environment. And so in that sense, they may look more like their tropical counterparts and maybe migration slows down your pace of life. Um, like I said, these results are still ongoing. We, 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 are, we are trying to figure this out right now. I, I'll tell you that the, the preliminary what we think is happening is something in between. We think that 
migration slows down your pace of life relative to non-migrant breeding at the same latitudes, but not maybe as much as um, uh, it doesn't make you a tropical bird, right? And so that migration might be this really weird behavior that puts you in an intermediate ground. Okay, so I've talked to you for almost 45 minutes, so I wanna stop and say thank you. Um, I typically blow through my acknowledgement slides, but I wanna pause here and thank CFO very specifically again. Um, we are now running eight different study sites, which feels crazy um, to even say out loud for um, this research, as well as several other research questions that I haven't obviously had time to touch on today. And we're cobbling together funds from a lot of different places to try to make these things happen. Um, and, and that's really challenging to do. And, and without the support of CFO, I mean, I can say very explicitly, um, some of this field work would not have happened. Um, this summer in particular, the, the 11 tags that we've been able to get back are, are really due to CFO. I'd also add to that that the primary field help that we have are undergraduate students. Um, funding people in science turns out to be one of the most challenging things um, to do. And yet it's also one of the most important. Um, undergraduate authentic independent research uh, experiences are the single greatest predictor of whether a student will continue and pursue a career in science. And we know that not all students have the capacity to do this in a volunteer role or to do this in a role where they're covering their own expenses. And so the ability for us to fund these students even a little bit um, is really an equity and diversity and inclusion issue and in that we're able to include more students from uh, greater diversity of backgrounds who are now having experiences and will hopefully be inspired to continue and, and move on with science. So um, thank you very much to CFO and to the granting committee and thank you very, very much to the individuals that donated to it. It's really important both for science and for education. And so with that, I'd love to stop and say questions, take questions. I will say I have been cruelly withholding from you the one thing that I would imagine most of you are here for, which is pictures of baby owls. So I'll put some up um, and I would be happy to, to take questions now. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Scott. That was truly one of a kind um, presentation. It was really amazing research, very interesting stuff. And again, our piece today is this. It's a beautiful Merlin. Birds of prey for the win. It could be yours. We have one bid in, I believe. If you're feeling generous and if you want to contribute to the wonderful things that we accomplish, that people like Scott accomplish with his little army of undergrads, <laughs> it really makes a difference. It really, really does. And so with that, I will go to our questions for our speaker today. Um, one question from Peg Rooney was, does telemetry affect breeding and the overall life of the bird? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, and the answer is maybe not super straightforward. So, I mean, yeah, the short version is yeah. Um, anything you do to these birds, anytime you handle them, their stress goes up. Anything you attach to them, stress goes up, it's weight on them. Um, so it certainly does. There's pretty strict guidelines that we adhere to about what's ethical to do. And we have multiple layers of permitting to sort of keep us, keep us honest on that. So the general rule of thumb in wildlife biology is you don't put more than 3% of an animal's body mass on it. Um, so, which is why I kept talking about the weight restrictions on, on, I mean, I can't put any of the really cool tags that the, the big animal species or big animal biologists do. Um, so yeah, we, we try to minimize that as much as possible by following those guidelines with state federal permitting, um, our own animal care, institutional animal care committee at, at CU and, and Colorado College. Um, the more subtle answer to that is it's actually something we're studying. So I mentioned that Brian has 40 years of survival data. We actually started cracking into that data set yesterday. And one of the questions that we're really interested in looking at is, you know, we've used a handful of different attachment types um, different ways of mounting them to these birds over the years for various things. And so one of the papers we're really excited to write is, is actually looking at this ex, um, empirically to just see like what, what does it do to the survival of the owls to put a GPS versus a geolocator versus a, a radio tag on the birds. And, and so, yeah, it's, an, it's another one of these stay tuned, I guess. That's really uh, interesting data. I can't wait to see the results on that because it is such a big question. It is. Okay, next we have from Karen White. Are there any studies being done in California where these owls migrate through given our horrific wildland fires in their habitat? 
Yeah, so um, there's not a lot being done in California. We should have done some this summer, actually, and, um, and COVID changed some of those deployment sites on us just based on um, who was able to travel where and who could get in the field. We were, we were pretty cautious about all of that. So I had been hoping to send some tags to a crew working on the West Slope of the Sierras um, to put some tags out there. Um, there's, there's a couple folks, so Dave Arsenault used to do some work in California, and there was a master student a couple years ago that did some stuff way in the northern part of the state and in southern Oregon. Um, but no, um, nothing, nothing really explicit. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, those are not mostly ponderosa pines in California, but they're the same. They're the yellow pines. So Jeffrey pines are, are primarily what's getting burnt up in those fires. Um, and that's another fire adapted species, and it's another uh, fire regime that is being pushed to way hotter, way drier conditions and way more severe fires. So the fires are getting more frequent, more severe, larger extent, um, and it's a it's a real threat to those ecosystems. Awesome. Um, from Elena Claver, are there any studies in their wintering slash permanent resident grounds in Mexico, and are there dangers of deforestation down there? Yeah, there are. Yes. Yeah, so yes and no. And those two questions are actually <laughs> super related. Um, so Brian's been down there a couple times. I went down with him once. We have um, a collaborator down at the University of Morelia Michoacan, uh, Javier Salgado Ortiz. Um, so we've gone down there and we've caught some birds. Um, you can really readily tell the, the residents. Um, they're quite a bit smaller, um, quite a bit more rufous, which is actually a general trend in birds in general, but in hotter, humid environments, stuff tends to be redder. Um, so you can usually tell, we mostly catch the resident birds. We found a couple of wintering birds. Um, so we wanna do more studies down there, but yes, there's a very real threat of logging. And um, it was it made the news this year, although I think a lot of folks' attention has been elsewhere. Um, a lot of the illegal logging has started encroaching into the UNESCO biosphere reserves for the monarch butterflies, which is what I told you about, which is um, some of the areas that we know our birds are wintering, right? So we've done trapping in these very reserves and outspoken advocates for conservation ended up being murdered this winter um, for their role in decrying the illegal logging. Um, and that actually put the kibosh on some winter field work that we should have done this year. So it's a challenging place to work. Um, we really want to do more. We have some tags in the hand of in the hands of Javier. We'd like to deploy down there. But yeah, I mean, there's just a thousand questions we could answer with a study down there. I will say one way that we're trying to get around it. One of the things our lab does quite a bit of is using sort of tissue chemistry to reconstruct the location. So we can use um, these things called stable isotopes in bird feathers. They'll vary predictably with latitude. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do is build a map so that if I have an unknown bird, I can tell you where on the planet um, that feather was grown. And what we've been doing is sending requests to museums that have specimens collected in Mexico in the winter. And then we can use that tissue chemistry to say where that bird had bred previously. So did it breed in Mexico or is it a migrant from somewhere else in North America? And that's one workaround to the challenges to working down there. But no, we haven't done nearly em enough in Mexico. We, we really need to. It's great down there. I mean, it's really cool, really cool mountains. That's awesome, but also a little intimidating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, from Peter Gent, we have when a godwit flies nonstop from Alaska to New Zealand and loses much body mass, does that slow its lifestyle down? Yeah, so that's the question. Yeah, um, you know, there's yeah, stay tuned, I guess. This is like a, a hotly contested thing. So there's a guy, Martin Wikelski, who actually works a lot with those white storks that I, I showed you the file stork of, who has, I think, put out some compelling papers suggesting that migrations maybe not actually as energetically costly as we would imagine. So yes, they, they lose a huge amount of their body mass, but they also have just put on a huge amount of body mass, right? So these birds, look, they'll put on like 30% of their body weight in a couple of days and just go burn it off. And so it, it may not actually be that hard to do that. And, and what we've seen is that continuous flight in birds doesn't actually raise their metabolic rates the way that you would expect it to relative to just normally flying around. Um, there's some folks that work with mammals that sort of guess the same thing, that maybe when mule deer migrate, they're not actually walking any, any more steps um, than, than they would if they were just eating. Um, so whether that slows down their life history by allowing them to experience this constant environment that favors bets on the future, 
or whether that is just this incredibly risky thing to do that you pay this huge metabolic cost for and you might not survive so you better bet on right now is yeah it's an it's an open question i i think i think it's going to be the former i think it's going to slow down life history but um but we don't i yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't put money on it yet all right nice um just to update listeners we have a bid going for hundred dollars for don march so far if you still want it hundred dollars plus please and i have a question from larry i think it's my before last question so far um larry asks are there any studies of other bird species with similar or dissimilar migratory hypotheses um Yes, I mean the short answer is uh, well. I guess I I I don't know exactly what hypotheses um, Larry means, but I mean there's zillions of studies about birds and, and why they're why they're migrating. Um, in terms of trying to, I think what what he means is has anybody looked ecologically for evidence of this um, this more modern interpretation of um, how migration would have evolved? And no. Um, surprisingly, I think that people have done studies that they could have framed that way, um, but nobody's really done it. This, this hypothesis, framing the idea that migration started from stable environments and evolved as an alternative adaptation to deal with winter rather than a way to chase resources, right? So, so we're saying migration is more like hibernation than it is going to the grocery store, right? Um, you know, that really has only been codified in the last 10 or 15 years. So there's a really obscure paper from 2007 that did a really nice job of this, but a lot of folks didn't read. And then Ben Winger's paper that did a phenomenal job and got a bunch of attention is, is only a couple years old. So there hasn't been a lot of time for the field to wrap their heads around that. And so, um, and in that time is when, um, tracking technology has really blossomed to the point that we can do this kind of this kind of work. Um, I mean, remember these GPS tags that we're using now, uh, five years ago did not exist, right? Mm -hmm. The satellite data um, that I'm pulling for free off the internet um, would have required a computer that would live in the basement of some secret government agency 10 or 20 years ago, right? The processing power it takes to process that amount of satellite data, like how green is the earth on 500 by 500 meter grid cells for the entire Western hemisphere for four years. Um, and I can do that on my laptop now. A few years ago, that was not a reality. That's what I meant when I'm, I say this is the golden age of it. So no, I think we're some of the first people to frame the question this way, um, which is why we're, we're super, super excited about it. But it's, it's not necessarily that we're super clever. Um, I think we're just at the right, at the right time to be addressing these questions. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. Um, last question and just to update everyone, our High bid now is Mary Ann Hardigan at 110, if anyone's still dying to have it first. Um, last question, and it's a good one. Paula Hansley was asking if there is any fossil evidence of this bird from anywhere in its range. That's a really good question, and yeah, I wish. Um, <laughs> there, there's like two extremely unconvincing um, records. So. Um, there's like one bone in an archaeological site in New Mexico um, that might be a flam and it might not be, but it's also like not that old and not that interesting. Um, it's in the last thousand years. Um, and there's another even less convincing bone that's also from the same um, era in Arizona. And that's it. Uh, we have no old fossils. So all that sort of range reconstruction um, is based on these models that, that these phylogeneticists can run. We just sort of work backwards from the distribution of animals that you have on earth now, and you know their relatedness and how they have that you know phylogenetic tree where they connect to their most recent common ancestors. And you can take their ranges now to infer something about the common ancestors ranges and then do that going back. And so, you know, it's not a bad method. It's, it's probably roughly correct roughly some of the time um but yeah i mean a flam fossil from 15 million years ago uh up in nunavut would be pretty cool and i have searched high and low for anybody that has something like that and uh and i've only ever come up with the two but yeah that is a good question actually all these are all really good questions so yeah 
But it is very cool that you are uh, looking into museum specimens to try and put that picture together through the resources that you have available. So I wish you a lot of luck. Hopefully you write us another wonderful proposal and we um, would love to contribute to your wonderful research once again. Well, I appreciate it. And again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to spend the evening with you all. And, and, and it's obviously one of my favorite topics to, to talk about. So I, I sort of do it whether I have an audience or not. But I, I appreciate you all being here and I appreciate everything CFO does. And um, it, it's a real honor to, to share this time with you all. So thank you. Absolutely. We have one more question if you can take it. One sure. just got snuck in at the last oh, minute. Nick Comar snuck one more in, of course, president. <laughs> Presidential privilege. The Colorado range map you showed accurate, or are there populations that are underappreciated? Yeah, the, no, the range maps are they're garbage. Um, I didn't I didn't spend time pointing it out. I mean, you like in our first four GPS tracks, uh, we had birds outside the range. Um, they're just they're they're hard to survey for. I mean, you can't use citizen science stuff like eBirds not useful for the species. There's no broad systemic surveys going on for them. We know that they like montane habitats, but I, I hear them up in subalpine. You can hear them lower. Um, yeah, it's not super accurate. I mean, the, the general rule of thumb, I would say, is that if you're in the mountains and it's forested, you have a shot. If you're in those mid-elevation ponderosa pine, mixed conifer, Douglas fir forests, um, you're sort of in the sweet spot I and mean, you hear them a ton in those habitats. And, and the bigger and older the trees are, the better off they are. One thing I will say is there's a really huge sex bias. There's way more males than females in the population. So even though you're hearing them, they're not necessarily breeding. And so they're, it makes them a tricky species to monitor. So a lot of the conservation status that it has, so it's a bird of conservation concern, forest service sensitive, BLM sensitive. Um, a lot of that has to do with just uncertainty. Um, we don't have strong data to suggest they're declining, but it's really hard to come by data. So, so it's, um, it's sort of a risky proposition to know um, how well they're doing. But yeah, those, those range maps need to be updated and, and combining some of these data sources, including these um, feather isotope studies and museum samples is, is part of what we'll do with that is, is try to get a better range map. Um, what time is best to listen for them in the evenings and uh, what approximately is population size looking like in Colorado? Yeah, so the second question I will answer, we don't know. We have no idea. Um, you can find Partners in Flight thinks there's 11,000 of them in North America, and I have no idea where that number came from um, at all. Um, I will, t I mean, I'll say like you can find them in Colorado pretty easily. In the front range, um, we're, we're pretty lucky. We're in great habitat for them. Um, as soon as you start getting above, even in those foothill zones, um, you hear them. You get up, if you're in the Denver metro area, you get up on Rampart Range Road and, and between the yahoos driving around and chainsawing at night, you can hear them. Um, so they'll arrive towards the end of May um, and they'll start calling right away. Um, last week of May, maybe the last two weeks of May through June is a great time. Um, that's when the, the courtship's happening. So both males and females are really vocal. And then the female will go off and incubate eggs and her energy demands are really low. So the, the male will provision the nest exclusively during that time, um, or pretty exclusively to the female, but she's just sitting in the cavity. So he's not making a lot of prey deliveries. And that's when calling rates are the highest. It's when the males are getting in the most fights with each other. July, um, you know, the eggs will hatch right around July, usually the last week of June, first week of July. Um, and, and that really changes uh, the behavior. You can still hear them calling. You can still, you can still strike them up. Um, but the calling rates really decline. August, same thing. And then, you know, mid-August, late August, it can pick up again. September can be a real hit or miss. I mean, we catch them in September for sure. Um, and then they will split basically the first few days of October, right, when it starts getting um, truly cold up in the mountains, they're out of here. But yeah, the best bet is, is, you know, Memorial Day weekend through July 4th, 8,000 feet in some ponderosa pines, find the biggest, oldest bonsai looking ones you can and, and you'll, you'll hear them. All right, so you've heard it from the expert. If you wanna contribute, start recording them so you have hard evidence. Yes, and put we'll it on Update eBird. those range maps, <laughs> upload that data to your eBirds. I know there's board members that are pro as well as Ted Floyd, because that really helps the scientists because they are busy people and getting that citizen science the most accurate we possibly can really, really makes a difference. Absolutely. So I absolutely am so grateful to you, Scott. Well done, it was amazing. I believe 
Our winner is Anne Marie with 110. Marianne Hardigan with 110 is our winner for this. Please contact Irene Fortune or the board to figure that out. We will send it to you and you can put it proudly on your wall for supporting science on birds in Colorado. Hopefully we will have an event that is all together sometime soon. We're hoping 2021, we will see where the future takes us. Don Marsh, be sure to be there. I know you're eager, you're ready for some of the beautiful art that we have, as well as some of the other bidders that were out there. Also, thank you to Julie Frost and Christy Payne for serving on our board and welcome Allison, as well as Megan. We are happy to have you. We're always recruiting. If you want to make a difference, if you want to be part of this amazing group of people that throw themselves together to make a difference, please think about it and join us. Also, alluding to Scott's um, note on the wonders of internet, sorry for the rough beginning. So there is the bad and the good, but it is also mostly good, sometimes a little awkward. Hopefully not many of you had to experience that, but we are learning, we will get better and we will password protect, but we will try to organize more of these as we go forward as well to support our scientists, to get their word out, to get their science out and to inspire all of you wonderful people that support that effort. We can't wait to see you in Pueblo 2021. We believe that it is going to happen. We will figure something out because we wanna go birding all together. Thank you so much for tuning in. We had over 72 people. We are really, really proud that this went off mostly without a hitch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much and have a wonderful night. Thanks everyone. And there they go. Yay. We had up to 80 at one point, just so you know. I thought so too. I wanted to go yeah. with 75, but. Yeah. yeah, I got 80 at the maximum. I think, awesome. we, I think we probably lost a few permanently, but uh, that wasn't too bad for a uh, first, <laughs> first run there. Um, other than the yep. beginning. But. Gloria <laughs> warned me. So, I, I tried to warn you. <laughs> Scott, that was a phenomenal presentation. I oh. went up with, with Brian Linkart a couple of years ago and was able to hold one of those itty bitty whatever Graham little fluff monsters. Um, so it's just fun to hear more about them. Oh, fantastic. Yes, I got to hold some too. They're so adorable. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. Brian's a great guy to spend a night or, or a day in the woods with. He's like such a fantastic uh, educator and naturalist and scientist. So yeah. Yeah. Stephanie, can we post a recording of the Scott's presentation to our website? I have already found out that you can trim things. Good. Oh, good. Yeah, well, <laughs> that would question. be really important. <laughs> there are some things I don't need to re-see. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Scott, before I lose you, it would be good to stay in touch. I, uh, about a year and a half ago, when I was visiting Oaxaca, I spent some time with a guy who was researching flams down there. Was it um, uh, uh, Ramiro? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've chatted with him and um, I know he's sort of slow playing, setting up his study, but we've, we've spoken about trying to collaborate a bit. Good. I had given his name to uh, Brian Linkhart and cool. uh, awesome. maybe that helped or maybe he found you, but um, yeah, I, I spent, I spent an afternoon birding with him. Awesome. He, um, yeah, he seems like a great, great guy. I've only spoken with him over Skype, you know, it, it's it's critical to have sort of local contacts down there. And I mean, it's the right thing to do, right? I mean, I don't need to swoop into somewhere, they, they call it parachute ecology, but um, just the ability to get access to land, it's not um, super straightforward. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he was fascinated. He really, you know, he studies just the um, non-migratory birds. So he, he'd be very interested to know more about the migratory side. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, no, I've been in touch with him and, and hopefully we can compare. I mean, what we'd love to do is just, I mean, the first cut is just compare some basic biology about those residents to what we know in Colorado. For yeah, yeah, exactly. But I'm sure he could get you feathers and all the other stuff you're looking for, but I'm glad yeah. you're in touch with him. Good. Yeah, awesome. Good okay. job, Scott. Good job, Stephanie.
Yeah, and, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. All right. Thanks, Bye. Nick. Take care, everyone. Oh, thanks again. That was so amazing. Thank no, you. So thanks, thanks for the invite. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, we're, we're really glad to hear that it advances diversity and inclusion and all those things, too, because it is one of our newest missions that we want to do and try to include more and try to recruit more for leadership and other levels, too. We want to make everyone feel included in birding as well as in all of the community. So, I mean, as far as advancing in science, it's the number one thing. And it's one of the things I really like about being at CU Denver. I mean, we have the most diverse student body, the most non-traditional students, the most students that are working while they're there, the most first generation college students. And those are exactly the type of people that um, aren't going to just walk into their professor's office and ask if they can go catch birds with them like I did, right? I mean, that's just that's that's a really privileged experience and so being able to even give a few hundred dollars to these students so that they can come up for a few weeks or spend a day a week in the lab is i mean it's just the best thing that we can do and we know that that changes outcomes in science so so thank yeah. you yeah <laughs> yeah we're i mean it changes trajectories of life almost yep. sometimes yep. it's that little nudge so thank you for being the man on the front lines doing it for us <laughs> Have All a good right. night and pat yourself on the back. You get a beer. <laughs> Thanks. I'll do that. <laughs> Bye. Bye.